Welcome to a new and renewed Sci-Fi Fantasy Network Writers Podcast. I'm Joel Corner, and this week I'm talking to Nathaniel Wayne, author of Dreams of Fire. They are perhaps best known for their YouTube channel, Council of Geeks, where they review and deep dive into geek media in a fun and engaging way. I've been a subscriber for a long time, and I suggest you go subscribe as well. So this is pretty cool for me. Uh, Nathaniel, thank you for joining us. Well, well, thank you for having me on. No problem. So let's talk about Dreams of Fire. Why don't you just uh, give the audience a rundown of uh, what it's about? So Dreams of Fire is a high fantasy adventure. It is set in a uh, completely fantasy world. And it follows a young man named Ferris who is on the run. He um, he is what is known as an elemental. These are people who exhibit um, and um, sort of build up within themselves specific elemental forces. In his case, he's a fire elemental, which makes him something that is generally feared, something that is legitimately potentially dangerous, and something that is uh, currently being hunted. So he is on the run, and um, it follows him in his attempts to um, keep and maintain uh, his own freedom in a world that really is uh, going to turn on him the instant almost anyone finds out who he is. Oh, dear. Uh I, I suppose he t- my my brain immediately went to you know if he uh, ends up uh, rolling down the hill is he a Ferris wheel? <laughs> oh. uh, not not spelled that way, <laughs> um, but uh, you know that's the that's the sort of the plot pitch tone wise. Um, the mantra I had about this book is that it is a small story in a big world. So, like I said, this is. A high fantasy story. It is. It is set in a world with its own history, lore, rules, magic, creatures, etc., etc., etc. But I very much did not want to tell the kind of epic, sweeping story that most people who write high fantasy tend to write. Um, I wanted to tell a much smaller story about characters who would not be written about if someone were to write the definitive history of these world of this world. In the grand scale, these people don't matter. But I still think that they have interesting stories to tell. That's that's uh, that's always a great um, uh, position to take. I think. Um, I think you might you might sort of view that like that's how something like The Hobbit starts out with that kind of vibe, and obviously grows into. Something yeah, that's else. that's kind of the comparison. Like I prefer The Hobbit to The Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings is great. Don't get me wrong, but Lord of the Rings is very much this is the epic story of Middle Earth, whereas. The Hobbit is just an adventure that happens within it. Mm. And so similar to um, uh, Tales of Tom Bombadil, I suppose. <laughs> you know, a thing that happens in Middle Earth. Um, uh, looking at the uh, the artwork, I know you've got an illustrated edition. Can you talk a little bit about uh, working with the artist? I honestly could not tell you exactly why I made the decision to have it be illustrated. I think think trying to reverse engineer it was i just i kind of wanted fan art but i could not count on this being popular enough to ever generate it um and and if i was going to commission art of characters and scenes and settings then i might as well use it in the book i that's might have been the origins but i'm not even positive on that um i worked with three different illustrators uh for the interior art um and that largely came down to scheduling because my uh, my initial artist, Natalie Lynn, um, I was working with for quite a while, but uh, ended up landing um, her own book deal and didn't have the time to keep working on my stuff. So that's when I brought in um, the other artists that uh, whose work appear in the book. So that was uh, the point that I brought in. Uh, M.L. Fries and uh, Benjamin Philby. Um, and uh, M.L., they, they ended up doing the most illustrations in the book and a couple from Benjamin. So it's it's a mix. They are complementary styles. I don't think they clash, but th- there are three different artists uh, inside. And that's all separate from the cover art, which was uh, another artist altogether. Uh, so how did you find working with the artist? Did you give them a lot of guidance or did you just give them... Uh, brief notes and let them run wild what i generally gave them was i gave them um 
a section of the book. So like what it was they were going to be illustrating. Um, so, you know, I, I would send them the passage and then anything that I felt was necessary description not contained in that passage. So like if the passage itself wasn't describing the characters, I'd give them a character breakdown of, you know, clothes, age, hair color, etc. cetera. Um, and then I would get back um, usually a preliminary uh, rough piece to tweak before they put too much time into finalizing it. And then, you know, maybe a little bit back and forth and then I'd, I'd get the final piece. And uh, the process, that that was the basic process. The timeline and such was a bit different between them because like Natalie works in um, in colored pencil. So we really had to nail down the sketch phase. Um, whereas Emma works in a digital from front to back, even at the sketch phase. So, um, their art was easier to tweak even at a later stage. Whereas with Natalie, if, if after I got it back in color, if there was something I wanted to tweak, it's too late. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that you had like a really clear image of what it should look like? And, uh, you had to sort of be really specific in your, um, directions. (laughs) I, this is going to sound odd. Um, in terms of the stuff that I got back, by and large, the artist interpretations were really either right on the money with what I wanted or weren't exactly what I had in mind, but I liked anyways. Mm -hmm. I had one super specific thing that I did have to um, go into detail explaining to uh, the artist who had to depict it. And that is, um, there's a character, um, named Garion who's a marshal, which is kind of like a bounty hunter, but a little bit more official. And he has these retractable talons on his fingers. And I had a very specific uh, image in terms of how, you know, the angle at which they curve and where they are attached um, on his fingertips. And so like that, that was a little bit of a back and forth um, to, to nail down exactly how that went. Although the other thing that was fun, um, with a couple of of Natalie's, I had like a fairly specific action pose that I wanted. So like I said, <laughs> I like took lousy pictures of myself <laughs> in these poses for reference. Hey, that's what they did on Avatar: The Last Airbender. So, hey, you know what? It's it's cheap and dirty and a little embarrassing, but it works. <laughs> well, I when I had my first book published, um, I had a bit of trouble with the. Um, the front cover uh it was the sea stone sword and i had this image of this sword that was you know carved from the sea and looked you know like it had been under the sea for a thousand years and the artist kept coming back with these just really cool looking you know sort of fantasy swords it's like no 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 you're making it look too cool uh, which is an interesting <laughs> problem to have uh it ended up looking great incidentally in case uh evelyn is listening uh, i love it uh well what's kind of funny with the cover art um was that i I probably had to do the least tweaking uh, of the cover of all of it. Um, the cover is was a uh, Yasushi Matsoka, and I think part of that was because I was able to provide him reference material for the one character who was going to be on the cover and for the city that was going to be in the background. I had very exact reference material for him to use. Um, but when I described what I wanted, he came back. Uh, to me with it like the first draft i was like oh my god that's gorgeous and that's perfect (laughs) (laughs) it's lovely when that happens uh so uh let's go back to the beginning of the book uh where did it spring from was it like a particular scene image or character or just a concept that you just thought i have to write this well uh, yes and no there was a very specific scene but it uh it wasn't like ooh. I must tell this story. So what what happened was I was in college because I've been working on this thing to varying degrees um, for 18 years. Um, but what I was in college and I was lying in bed and I couldn't sleep, which is actually really atypical for me. Normally I fall asleep very easily. Um, and I just had this image in my head of... Um, well, I, I at the time, I'm now significantly older than the than Ferris is in the book, but at the time kind of projecting myself into the scene and sort of picturing, you know, lying on the floor, uh, gripping his wrist. Well, why is he gripping his wrist? Well, because it's burning. Like he got burned? No, like something inside him is burning. Like, oh, 
okay, why is that happening? And sort of getting up and just asking myself a series of questions about what, why, uh, for all these things that, um, you know, my brain was starting to formulate. And I ended up writing out what ended up being, I would say, the latter half of the first chapter. And it's still in there. I mean, you know, rewritten and revised and all that. But, um, you know, what I sat down and wrote originally is now in the book. And over time, um, you know, very slowly initially, um, sort of coming up with bits of lore and things to add and creatures to integrate and coming up with rules. Um, cause like, I'm not a, I'm not a world builder by nature. I'm not good at sitting down and going, I will now create the history and the background of like, I can't do that. So it was something that I chipped away at for a long time. Um, and then about eight years ago, um, finally deciding, you know, oh, for God's sake, just write a draft of the damn thing. Um, it's always the toughest so that, part. That's when I, that's when I finally had a, had a working draft. But it, it, it was initially just that scene of a, of a young man. Something inside him is burning. Something inside that he can't control and something that he's afraid of. And building off of that, everything started from that. Cool. Um, so you say it's very character driven. Uh, did you have a favorite character to write? So, uh, my favorite character to write, I'm trying to think of how to describe him because he, he shows up part of the way in, but he does not get named until later. Not that like his name is a twist or anything, but that's part of who he is. He's a very closed off character and he doesn't want someone like Ferris to even know his name. Um, that's, that's a level that he's just not okay with interacting with him at. And I, and I did, I enjoyed writing him a lot. I enjoyed writing this kind of um, closed off, but maybe not quite as shut down as, as he wishes he was mm. like his life would be easier if he was as shut off as he pretended to be, <laughs> but still very much a very shut off character. Um, and like, None of this comes up in the book, but I know why he's like this. And so I had a lot of fun not only writing him, but you only see him from Ferris's perspective. So Ferris doesn't understand why he's like this. But I do, and I have a lot of fun. I have a lot of fun writing him. Um, the description reminds me of Avon from uh, Blake Seven. <laughs> That's my, <laughs> where my brain immediately goes to. Um, so, uh, what are the parts of writing that you really get absorbed into, where you find yourself sort of, you know, just writing and writing and losing track of time? Um, I'm not sure there's ever a point which I lose track of time, but I tell you what I always do first is I always start with dialogue. Dialogue is how I get a feel for the characters. I I write their voice. I write how they speak, who they interact with and how, you know, the ways in which they respond to certain ways of being talked to, the way they talk to others. I I take to dialogue very naturally and it's by far the easiest thing for me to write. I'm not going to go so, so far as to be like it's what I'm best at. That's for other people to judge, but um, I really, I really tend to start with dialogue first, then build out more about the characters based off how I've written their voice and then, you know, work on setting and scene and the rest of it after that. But almost everything always starts with how do they talk? It's like, um, uh, I mean, I've been playing a lot of Dungeons and Dragons at the moment. Uh, I'm an eternal DM. Uh, and so a lot of the characters, it's like, how do they talk? What's their voice like? Um, and you know it's coming up with the uh, sometimes a funny accent, sometimes just a, a manner of speaking that can tell you a lot about a character. Yeah, and like it, it, it was funny um, because it, it was one of the things I had to get better at um, through the revision was just you know I'd have the lines, but I would have to find ways to describe how those lines were actually being said. Um, because I think part of the reason I gravitate towards dialogue is I, like, I have a passion for acting. I'm a, I'm a theater person. I tried to get into film. It didn't work, but, um, you know, so I'm used to when trying to connect to, to a character is just seeing dialogue, you know, on a page, on a audition sheet or what have you. So to me, I'm used to seeing dialogue without a lot of signifiers as to how it's meant to be read. But that's not what you do in novels, because if you don't say how 
those words are being said, then it's possible for the reader to hear the wrong tone, hear the wrong intonation, hear the wrong emphasis. So I, I actually had to sort of train myself to write more explicitly um, character actions because kind of in my brain, it was like, oh, well, I'll leave that to the actors. Then I'm like, there aren't any actors, you <laughs> moron. It's just you. <laughs> Uh, I, I uh, my one of my editors uh, sent me a, a very good book, um, which I'll recommend to everyone. Here, uh, it's called uh, the Emotional Dictionary. Uh, it's a great little um, resource. It's just uh, lists of like emotions and then like associated actions and facial expressions and uh, thought patterns that go with them. It's really useful just just to sort of flick through when you're thinking of a story and the character and go, oh, here's an interesting way I can interpret that. Uh, because often, like being a writer, you almost have to be a director as well. You're directing the reader as well as the characters into um, how the scene is going to be played. So, uh, skipping forward to a different question, you've done some acting. Uh, you were in a Doctor Who audio uh, fan audio recently, manipulated malfunction. Um, so, do you want to talk about the um, how being a writer and being an actor, how those interact like does um acting give you a different perspective on writing and vice versa um i think the main thing that acting gives me in ter- in terms of my perspective on writing is just the way is just where i start um you know i think it's why i tend to start with dialogue and character voices and start with characters and and work on plot later now that isn't to say i i'm not one of those i'll hear writers sometimes talk about how you know they'll let the characters decide where the plot goes I can't do that. Um, if I don't know where I'm going, I will never finish. I, I have to know where I'm headed. So like, I don't want to make it sound like I don't come up with a plot at all. But um, I always start with, okay, who are the people who I want to be involved in this? Then I'll come up with the story I want to tell. But then before actually writing that out, I'll figure out, okay, if that's the story I'm telling, who are the other characters who are going to show up in a story like this? And so... Even after I come up with a plot outline, I will circle back to characters and flesh those out before um, actually starting to write much of anything. Because I, what I don't want to have happen is I don't want to get to a situation where I'm at a point in the plot where I'm like, oh, I need a character who will you know, do X, either because narratively I need that to happen or it would make sense if a character showed up to do this and I don't already have one ready. Um, it like, it breaks my writing flow, not to just have the characters ready to go to plug in when they show up. Mm. Yeah. You got to have the, the, the old plant and payoff. So you gotta, you gotta be able to have a seed there planted already. Um, well, pl- planted for my purposes. It's funny. Like I, the, one of the earlier drafts I, someone read and they're like, I really like how you set this up and then paid it off later. I'm like, Oh crap. I didn't even realize yeah, I did that. I've done that a couple of times. <laughs> Like it, it's it's always great when they think you're more clever than you are. Yeah, this, I like to call it un, unintended foreshadowing. <laughs> like I have a character say say a phrase, and uh, it just happens to be a phrase that I like, and therefore I use it again. And someone goes, "Oh, that's that's nice." Sort sort of mirroring that. I was like, "Oh no, it's just I thought that was a cool phrase." <laughs> um, so, having done your YouTube channel, you do a lot of uh, reviews and uh, media criticisms. Uh, would you say that that's given you kind of a sense of um, general sort of storytelling pitfalls and how to avoid them? Um, yes and no. I mean, in in some ways, because I've been working on this book for so long, my sensibilities as a media critic have evolved along with the story being written. Um, you know, because if you go back to before YouTube to when I was writing movie reviews for websites that don't exist anymore... Um, you know, I, I was starting to get my sensibilities at the same time as I was coming up with a lot of the stuff that would, uh, eventually, you know, be in this book. I would say the main thing that it gave me was just not so much narrative pitfalls for the story I wanted to tell, but just a list of things that like, I don't want to do that at all. Um, so like my sensibilities and the things that tend to drive me nuts, you know, talking about uh, entertainment and media is why there's no romantic subplot for the lead character 
because I don't like them 99.5% of the time. It's why there is no chosen one. There is no great war. There is no rising evil. There is no dark lord. There's not like I'm, I'm so – I had a list of things. I'm like none of this. Absolutely none of this shows up in the book. And I mean part of that is it's stuff that I'm tired of. But another part of that was I – I am more interested in what I can do absent this list of stuff I see everywhere. So I don't want to make it sound like I'm too good to write that kind of stuff, but but a bit more, okay, if I'm not doing any of that, what will I write? There are other stories out there to be told. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so um, what are you working on next? Is there a sequel? Um, sort of. <laughs> So uh, this is kind of funny to talk about. I have about 80% of what I would call a side quill or a companion novel. So it's set in the same world. It is not dealing with the same characters. It's not even on the same part of the continent. Um, but it, it is in that world and it's exploring more of that. There's only one character who appears in both and in one of them it's a cameo. So that is on my to-do list. That's not something that I intend to do next, though, because if I wanted to, I could probably have that dusted up and ready for publication next year. But I do not want to set a precedent of coming up with books in this series that rapidly mm. because <laughs> I don't have a I don't have a third one anywhere near that degree. So if I pop out a second one right away and then it takes me five years to get to another one, that's that's just a bad look. Um, but part of why I say it's, it's kind of funny is I think um, people who didn't latch on to my intention to, in, to deliberately keep the story smaller. Um, like there was one review I read, which was positive, but... It sort of started from the premise of the reviewer was dead certain that this novel was a prequel for stuff I intended to do later. And it's not. <laughs> this is the entire story I wanted to tell. Um, and I kind of wish I could have like a one-on-one -on -one conversation with this person and be like, so why do you assume that there must be a bigger story later? Because uh, this is actually it. Mm. <laughs> That's not to say that I'm, I won't ever pick up with these characters again, but right now I have no plans to. I do plan to do more in this world. Um, that said, the, the next thing I want to tackle writing wise is that would actually be a big departure for me because it would have no fantastical elements. And so, uh, remember how I said I, I really hate romantic subplots. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, the next thing I'm working on is just a flat out romance book. <laughs> um, so, well, that's not I, subplot. I'm, I'm that's try plot. <laughs> that's true, but I am based like I don't like most things where the romance is front and center either. The reason I focus on subplots is subplots worm their way into genres mm -hmm. that I do like, whereas romance is a genre I just tend to avoid in general. Um, but I, I've kind of like set a challenge for myself: to, can I write a romance that I wouldn't hate? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I look forward to that. Actually, I'm I'm genuinely curious. Uh, well, we'll we'll see. I don't want to drop too much else about it because, like, there's I can I'm oh probably about thirty percent of the way into a draft on that one, and I know where it's going because, like I said, I have to know where it's going. Um, and there's a number of things about it that I think are I don't want to say unique because I don't know the romance genre as well, but I I will say comfortably things not often explored in mainstream romance. Um, but I also don't want to tip my hand on that because, you know, I don't know when it will be ready. So I'm not, I'm not ready to overhype it. So you say you're going to return to this world. Um, what is it about this world that you feel drawn back to again and again? Honestly, part of it is probably just the sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> I've spent so many, so many years sinking my time and thoughts and creative energies into this thing. That, you know, not doing more stories in the world feels like a waste. Um, I'm not going to say this. The only reason I, I like I there's a lot about this world that I like playing with, but I would be kidding myself if I pretended that wasn't at least part of it. Um, but it's it's just something that I've, I have a high degree of ownership of. And, you know, I there's 
and like I can name my influences and say where I got certain ideas or whatever, but the the assemblage of it and what it is and how it works just feels very me in a way that I'm not sure anything else I write ever will. So it's 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 not just getting to play in a sandbox. It's getting to play in a sandbox I built. Mm. That's a really and good way of talking about it. There's something more appealing about that. I'm, I'm going to have to steal that phrase at some point. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, would you like to uh, plug your channel and other projects? Okay, there's a long list. Okay. <laughs> so, um, as mentioned at the at the top end, um, my uh, my sort of premiere work goes up on the Council of Geeks YouTube channel. That's where you'll find my most um, polished works talking about, um, you know, patterns in uh, in representation and p- sometimes, you know, slightly speculative stuff or what's been going on in various aspects of fandom or in specific fandoms. There's also the Break Room of Geeks, which is a little bit looser, and that's where most of my actual reviews go these days because I don't script my review work. Um, and then... There is also, if um, it didn't come up over the course of this conversation, but uh, I, I am gender fluid. And if you are more interested in that aspect of my life, you can look for Vera Wild, Wild spelled W-Y-L-D-E. Um, and you can find that on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, uh, and Twitter, uh, if that aspect of my life is of any interest to you. I also have a podcast, the Council of Geeks podcast, which is currently playing home to What the Frell, which I do with fellow YouTuber Jesse Gender, where we're going through uh, every episode of Farscape. For me, it's a rewatch. For her, it's her first time. And I am also on a D&D um, Twitch uh, live streaming campaign uh, called Quill and Sword, which uh, if you catch it live is on alternating Thursdays twitch.tv slash partridge quill um uh or if you miss those they go they get uh uploaded the uh the off thursdays at uh, quill and sword on youtube and finally i have my own twitch channel which is twitch.tv slash council of geeks uh at present i am playing through a uh a visual novel called pair a normal um so that's what's going on there, and that's on Wednesdays, uh, ten thirty Eastern. Uh, when I do that, I hope you're all taking notes. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll put this I, in I the have, description. I mean, here's this is what happens when you make your living doing this <laughs> stuff. You accumulate a lot of it. <laughs> well, it has been a pleasure talking to you uh, over this uh, interview, and uh, I'm glad to be back doing this podcast again. Uh, so, uh, Nathaniel, thank you for joining us. Yeah, absolutely. Had a great time. 